Hello, my name is Andrew Yeoman. I'm a consultant hepatologist in the Gwent Liver Unit in South Wales. It's a great pleasure to be asked by the PBC Foundation to talk to you about the consequence of cirrhosis, uh, namely ascites, encephalopathy and bleeding. So the first question to consider is what actually is cirrhosis? Well, cirrhosis is simply the development of a certain degree of scar tissue, in this case, severe scarring, and that's what we call fibrosis of the liver. We stage fibrosis between naught and four, naught being no fibrosis, and stage four being cirrhosis. Now, the two biopsy pictures uh, below point out to different degrees of fibrosis. You see these blue, gray, wispy areas uh, within, the, uh, within these liver biopsy specimens, and the one on the left shows only minimal scar tissue or fibrosis, but the one on the right, you'll see there are bands uh, of fibrosis, of scar tissue, uh, wrapping themselves around islets of liver cells. And this is what we call nodule formation. And this is characteristic of cirrhosis. Now, not everyone in PBC will develop cirrhosis. This is an important consideration, but approximately 40 to 50% of people with PBC will develop cirrhosis in their lifetime. The next important question is, does everyone with cirrhosis develop complications? Well, the simple answer is no. Stable cirrhosis is an asymptomatic condition and many people can walk around not knowing they have cirrhosis, whether that's related to PBC or other liver conditions. And people can lead a normal or near normal life with cirrhosis. But the complications that I've been asked to talk to you about or the consequences occur when portal hypertension develops. So it's really important now to think just very briefly about what is portal hypertension. The schematic on the bottom right of this slide shows the liver at the top left, and the blue structure is the portal vein. This takes blood from the guts in the superior mesenteric and inferior mesenteric vein and from the splenic vein. So when the portal pressure rises, when the portal vein gets congested because of a scarred liver, then the spleen gets enlarged. And that's something you may have seen on ultrasound scans if you're known to have cirrhosis. So simply, when the liver becomes increasingly scarred, the pressure goes up in the portal vein, and that's what we mean by portal hypertension. Now, this schema is really set out to try and explain a little bit more in detail about how cirrhosis leads to portal hypertension and then on to the consequences I've been asked to talk to you about today. So cirrhosis can cause two major processes. Uh, one is liver scarring and another is chemical changes. So liver scarring leads to increased resistance of blood flow, which increase, increases the pressure in the portal vein. And the chemical changes lead to increased liver blood flow which similarly will increase the pressure within that portal venous system. Once portal hypertension develops, which is not inevitable with everybody with cirrhosis, then three major mechanisms can occur, which can lead to the consequences I'm talking about. First is salt and water retention, which leads to ascites and, and fluid accumulation. Second is varices, which are, which are uh, vein-like structures, typically in the lower esophagus, and they can lead to bleeding. And the third is increased toxin, build up because of a, a failure of clearing it by the, by the damaged liver. And this leads to something called encephalopathy. So ascites is the accumulation of fluid in the abdominal cavity, and it may or may not be associated by um, edema or swelling of the lower limbs. It's the commonest complication of cirrhosis we see in hospitalized patients and two thirds of admissions to my uh, hospital um, have ascites as that complication. And it's driven by salt and therefore water accumulation, as I've already said, and this is important in the initial management. It can lead to significant abdominal discomfort, and this can lead to impaired nutrition, which will lead to a vicious spiral of poor nutrition, poor physical functioning, and increasing fluid accumulation. Ascites can also be complicated by an infection called SBP, or spontaneous bacterial peritonitis. And this can be very serious indeed, and it's something we need to check for when people present with ascites, particularly for the first time. The treatment of ascites, as I've alluded to, is salt restriction in the first place. But then we'll often use diuretics or water tablets in the vernacular, and these work by two major mechanisms. First, we use them to try to stop you retaining salt in the first place. And these water, water tablets or diuretics are called spirolactin or sometimes amylaride. And the second mechanism is to make you excrete extra water. And we use furosemide as the commonest diuretic to help us achieve that. But in severe or tense societies, an abdominal drain is often needed. And this is called a paracentesis. If regular paracentesis is needed, 
then we might need to consider either a TIPS or a transplant. And this schema at the bottom right shows the inferior vena cava, which is the main blood vessel that takes the main vein that takes blood back to the heart, which sits right next to the liver. And what happens is the tip shunt, you'll see here with, with the, uh, the yellow arrow, um, forms a connection between the, the, the veins leading into the, the inferior vena cava, into the portal vein. And that allows the portal vein to decompress for the pressure to fall to reduce the portal hypertension. And that can reduce the ascites. If this doesn't work or is not indicated, then liver transplant is often considered in people needing regular drains. A final thing to talk about in terms of the, the management or treatment of ascites is it's really important to increase protein and calorie intake because muscle loss uh, and what we call sarcopenia will tend to make ascites worse. So it becomes a vicious cycle. And sometimes that can be, become easier to manage through better nutrition. Now, hepatic encephalopathy is the second most common complication of cirrhosis and affects 50% of people uh, with cirrhosis at some point in their lives. It's due to an accumulation of toxins that the damaged liver can't clear, and this is exacerbated by the, the rise pr raised pressure in the portal vein, leading to that blood being diverted away from the liver to the brain where it can cause significant effects. It classically fluctuates, but may be persistent, uh, and it leads to an array of problems in the neurological system, with things as subtle as an altered sleep pattern, due to impaired attention, difficulty with fine motor tasks, so falls are common in people with encephalopathy, as it progresses, it leads to confusion and disorientation, and extreme cases can cause profound drowsiness and even coma. The treatment of HE is to look for the triggers of it, which are often infection. A bleeding episode from varices can trigger a bout of encephalopathy. Dehydration and sedative drugs will all exacerbate uh, people prone to encephalopathy. The initial specific management, though, uh, uses lactulose therapy, which most people know as a laxative, but here we use it to reduce the chance for bacteria in the bowel to produce ammonia, which is the toxin that, that causes HE in the main. We aim for bowels to be open two to three times a day to increase the excretion of the, these uh, toxin-producing bacteria from the gut. If this is not effective or people can't tolerate lactulose, we use a drug called rifaximin, which is an antibiotic, which effectively sterilizes the gut and probably reduces the amount of bacteria to produce uh, the toxins. But again, the, the precise mechanism by which it improves encephalopathy is not entirely certain. But liver transplant is recognized as the best treatment for people with persistent or severe hepatic encephalopathy. If you move on to bleeding, so bleeding will occur in the, in the context of liver disease and cirrhosis from something called varices. And varices are like varicose veins in the intestine. Now, classically and most commonly, these will occur in the esophagus, but can occur in the stomach, small intestine, or lower bowel, usually in the rectum, the last part of the large bowel. Now, 50% of people with cirrhosis will develop varices, and of those, half of those will have a bleeding episode from those varices. But the bleeding typically occurs when the pressure suddenly increases in the portal vein. It's not an inexorable or an inevitable consequence of having varices. And this can often be triggered by infection, like hepatic encephalopathy can be, or due to the worsening of the underlying liver disease, whether that's PVC or alcohol or any other cause. Now, bleeding episodes are very dramatic, they are noticeable, and they can be very serious, but 90% of people will still survive the initial bleeding episode, but it might, may lead to an episode of worsening deterioration, encephalopathy, and other consequences. The treatment of bleeding initially is with resuscitation, um, if the blood pressure is low, and people will not often need a blood transfusion if the blood uh, count is extremely low. We then use antibiotics to prevent secondary infection, which is common in people who have an episode of bleeding from varices. And we use a drug called terlipressin uh, in the acute uh, setting to reduce the portal vein pre pressure. It causes constriction of the blood flow to the, to the varices and can minimize bleeding. This is all by time to safely undertake an endoscopy where if we see bleeding varices, we will place rubber bands to try and prevent further bleeding. After endoscopy, beta blockers uh, are then used to further reduce the pressure in the portal vein, and these can be very effective at preventing re-bleeding. And repeated endoscopies and banding are needed to eradicate varices, and usually two to three courses, uh, or two to three end endoscopies is required to bring the varices under control. 
But if all these above treatments fail, then once again, the tips I've already mentioned may be needed. This can be, again, a very effective therapy at reducing the portal pressure, reducing the portal hypertension, and preventing further bleeding. These pictures, the picture on the left shows um, quite significant esophageal varices. And on the right, you, you will see they look darker because uh, you will see that there's a little black rubber band placed at the base of these things, which, which causes the blood in these varices to congeal uh, so that that clot then prevents bleeding and eventually those bands will fall off and, and the varices will tend to reduce in size. So in summary, the complications or consequences of cirrhosis are not inevitable if you have cirrhosis, but they do reiterate the importance of optimal treatment for your PBC if you've not responded to first line therapies. If people do develop consequences of cirrhosis, uh, ascites, hepatic encephalopathy and bleeding are all consequences, of not just cirrhosis, but the development of portal hypertension. And as I've uh, outlined, there are specific treatments that exist for each of those particular consequences. In some people, more invasive treatments such as TIPS or even liver transplant may be needed to manage some of those complications. But people do need to be fit to be able to tolerate those interventions. So it comes back to it remains fundamentally important that you keep as physically active as possible. And good nutrition really does help in terms of getting people through uh, complications of cirrhosis and helping them get through the rigors of TIPS or a transplant. So thank you for, for your attention. I really hope you found that information useful to you.